Hello folks, I hope you're having a great day today. Today I've got something special for you. It's the Brain in the Jar, published in the 1920s uh, for Weird Tales in, in its first year of our pop publication. Um, and what, I, what this actually is, and I know a lot of you folks out there really like when you, to, just like me, you'll like reading when the first time something happened. Um, and you like going back to that sort of first thing, when it was fresh, um, when it was not a trope. Or anything like that. And so what you're going to be reading here today is The Brain in the Jar by Richard F. C. Wright. We're going to take a look at it. And, and this is the beginning, um, if you will, of the brain in the jar vats uh, and such that are talking to people, controlling them, interacting with them, and become a part sort of, of horror, uh, science fiction, adventure, uh, everything from comic books and, and heroes to more. And this has now become a popular trope, at least in American fiction. So what I want to do is get to where it started, and this is the brain in the jar. Now, when I was doing some research for this story, I actually didn't see a whole lot of people talking about this online. Um, like, for example, when I looked up one of the sort of places that talks about this sort of sub-trope, if you will, of horror, the, the brains in the jars in, like, say, Wikipedia, um, it didn't actually link to this article, even, even or, or this story, even though it was earlier than any of the ones that were cited. So I added it in. <laughs> uh, but you can see it there. It's in the, it, it, again, uh, it's, it's earlier than any of the other stories that are cited out there. Um, and if you read the, the, the notes from the writers, uh, what you will see what ends up happening. Uh, Richard C. Wright gr has just graduated from college, um, as well as one of his friends. The two of them kind of sit down and they're planning out their lives, planning out what to do. Um, how to get a lot of that money, that cash money, uh, and also how to uh, get you know they want to get that money, get those cars, get those the boats. Right, they want to live large, and they believe that writing is the way to do that. Obviously, in the pulp era, that was diluted. <laughs> that was never going to happen. Anyway, uh, lots of pulp writers were publishing a you know a story a month, and we're not making that much money, uh, as you can see from somebody somebody very popular like Robert E. Howard, um, who had to start who had to stop writing for Weird Tales and start writing for other places. Uh, because he wasn't getting as much money as he was expecting. Anyway, you get the point. So the two of them kind of sit down uh, right after graduating, trying to figure out what a great way, uh, uh, something new and inventive. And as they're sitting and talking about it, they re they come across this idea, and his friend suggests it of a uh, brain in the jar. So they think it's particularly clever, and they start sort of unpacking it. Um, so Richard C. C. Wright writes it, writes it down, um, and, and his friend gets co-writer credit. Uh, and then C. Wright sends it off to Weird Tales. Uh, Weird Tales publishes it. Um, and by this time, Weird Tales had started their sort of um, poll of the week for the readers poll asking uh, which of the stories that were published in Weird Tales were their favorite of that month. A few months later, they'll publish them. And this was also the reader's favorite story of that, that, that one. It was published, I think, in the 11th month of Weird Tales, and I think 24. Uh, and, and so, so it's in the early mid twenties uh, for the brain in the jar, and again, it predates the other sorts of brain in the jar vats, brains thinking uh, apart from themselves in suspended chemicals. It's actually pretty cool, and I think it's pretty well written for something that was right out of the for guys right out of college. And so, so I think I think there's a lot of stuff going on. It does resonate with a lot of people. I know Lovecraft loved it. He, you can read a number of letters that Lovecraft and C. Wright ex exchange. Uh, you can see that he really thought it was a well-written story. He was hoping that Weird Tales was going to republish it as part of their sort of classics uh, in the mid-30s um, so that a whole new generation of writers could experience how good it was. And um, anyway, C. Wright's going to write a little bit later on. Um, he's going to join the mythos. He's going to write some stories in the Cthulhu mythos like the warden sealed casket, stuff like that. Uh, and so, and he talked to with the hoarder of knowledge, things like that that he does here and there. Uh, he's going to create some things behind the scenes too, and letters that Lovecraft will grab and put into his stories. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so he is someone who's in that sort of era of writing. Uh, and, and again, he's written his first story after him and his friend come up with this idea of the brain in the jar. So here's what's going to happen in the story. Um, just shortly, what's going to end up wind up happening is is that you're, you're it's going to be set in the late 19s. Uh, 19 teens, uh, right after World War I has concluded. And our main character is going to be somebody who was a spy uh, for the American service in Germany during World War I. After World War I has ended, he doesn't believe he's going to be able to get out of the country safely. Um, even though the war has ended, Germany is hostile towards um, you know, spies and such that were in the country. Um, and even though the war has ended, they are not exchanging prisoners. <laughs> right? They're still bringing people to justice. And he believes uh, that, his, that if his cover's blown, he's not going to be able. So right now he's working at a hospital ward. He's been working there for a few months with some false um, identity that he assumed of a local German person. 
Um, he believes the doctor of this institute that he's working at, who's famous and incredibly smart um, and gifted, also incredibly antagonistic too, and he serves as the antagonist of the story, um, and not a nice person in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but he's going to be, uh, he, th he's, he believes that he's um, suspecting that this person may not be who he says it is, our main story. Anyway, so our main character is going to be trying to figure out what's going on. This doctor has been spending a lot of time uh, with stuff. He was he was part of a lot of experiments. He was um, one, the person who uh, was behind the mustard gas that was being used in World War Two. Uh, I'm sorry, World War One in on the battlefield um, and trench warfare. It seems like he was one of the major major chemists of World War One. Um, he seems to be a brilliant person, and so our our main character slash spy who's working at the, uh, former spy in this case, uh, who's working at the this place, this health uh, clinic, will um, go slip into this person's study while he steps out once late, late at night in order to go grab some stuff uh, from another floor. Uh, while he slips into this man's study, he's going to come across this um, this un high, th this just horror striking thing. Um, he sees this basically this jar on a shelf over some medical supplies and chemicals, and what he, and it has this weird opaque color to it. And then slowly, it's going to become more and more clear. And when it does, he's going to see within a brain that is suspended in these chemicals, a human brain, uh, with two eye stalks attached to it uh, with their normal uh, optic nerves that are looking straight at him. It's an incredibly uncomfortable scene, and he's there for a while. Um, he then uh, he believes that he's been there too long. Um, he leaves to leave, leaves the fleet of space, um, comes across, has a close um, scare encounter with the, the doctor, barely manages to escape without being seen. Uh, he'll come back later when the doctor is out for uh, a consultation on a, on a dying famous um, horror uh, German person from the war, and he goes out to check on that person and leaves. It's another opportunity. Our main character is going to go on in, take another look. He's going to take a, a pad of paper because he wants to sketch all the apparatuses that are connected to this machine, as to the vat that the brain is in, um, as well as the brain itself. When he does so, um, he believes that the, the brain has kind of taken over his mind and starts to has written something on French on a pad of paper. Um, he just, he figures out what it says. Uh, and it says that uh, it, it gives a date and time for the next day uh, so he, and to be in the office. He returns to the office that day, although our main, our main bad guy, antagonist, was, was, has left. Um, he goes to bed early. He retires early because uh, he's feeling sleepy. It's, and so um, our, our hero goes into the office and the brain takes over and writes down an entire conversation in French on this pad of paper where he tells what his story. Basically what's happened is, is that he's also a spy too, and that's why he kind of recognized the person. He was a famous French spy who had done a lot for the resistance to bring in uh, uh, the, the, the Germans down uh, from inside Germany. He was found near the last days of the war, but his final reports uh, were part of the reason why the war was able to end. Um, and this famous French spy was um, never re re was 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 even after the armistice had occurred, and you were supposed to exchange prisoners. He was never exchanged. Um, he's tortured, won't reveal the secrets, um, and for his role in bringing down the Germans during World War One, he will be um, killed, um, but not killed in the sense of you know just I'm going to kill you and you're done, but killed in the sense that he's going to be a part of an experiment that's being done by this famous. Um, biologist in Germany that's our main antagonist and he does an experiment on him to remove his brain and eyes living and then suspend them in this chemical solution um, that will keep him alive uh, and the water gets gets um, dim and then re regains it because he can't blink um, and that's a blinking mechanism that will save his lives from being destroyed uh, so that's that's been built into the, the chemical aspects of the water and the apparatus that's attached to it um, and he seeks his revenge against the doctor and he has been working and gaining um, over the year or so since it's happened, he's been working on being able to read minds, control things, levitate things, um, and he's become very, very powerful. So now all he seeks uh, is the death of the person and his revenge and his justice against the doctor who has put him in this condition. And I will stop it there, because you that way you <laughs> and pull it back, um, and you'll see what it winds up happening. You can read about it. Uh, let's see what happens with our spy brain or our spy hero. There are two spies. <laughs> there are a couple of interesting things in here. Germany was not, I mean, Germany in World War I was not Germany in World War II, right? 
Um, they were not the same Germany. I think it's interesting. But this is written just a couple of years after by the, the enemies. So I, I can understand why Germany was kind of evilified um, to a few, to, to some additional degrees. I mean, if this had been written after World War II, two, five, or five or six years, I think you would have been like, yeah. <laughs> must, I, even, I even accidentally said mustard gas in World War II rather than uh, in the consecration camps rather than World War I, which where it was used on the battlefield instead. Um, accidentally earlier in this uh, video because... Again, that you kind of had that feeling of it. Yeah, but just again, this is an early in the 20s um, when Germany has just finished up their war. But anyway, I think it's a fun, interesting story. Um, the idea of this brain in the vat is a very interesting and iconic concept that was created by these two people, um, and particularly the friend who's credited as a co-writer, and then as well as Seawright who writes the story. And again, it was a, a one of the readers poll for the, their favorite story. It stuck with you. It's a good story. A lot of things happen. I mean, if you have two separate heroes, <laughs> the brain, who's a hero of a famous French resistance, a spy, and then our main character, who's also a famous ex-spy from America, who just wants to get back home. Obviously, these two people are going to have some action scenes. Fun things are going to happen. It's, it's not that long in this collection. My collection's from Necronomic and Press, um, as you can see here. Um, I'll try to find you a place online uh, or I or in a collection in, in in Amazon. I'm not sure what's available out there, uh, but anyway, there's the brain in the jar for you from Weird Tales in 1924. So let me know what you thought. Have you read about it? Um, did you know that the brain in the jar was the first brain in the jar? Uh, uh, one of that first sort of subgenre uh, and such. And I know a lot of folks out there li are like me and they really like reading those sorts of things. So this is a real treat for those folks. But anyway, there you are. That's the brain in the jar by Richard C. Wright. Let me know what you thought about in the comments below. I'm happy to engage you with it further. Um, if there's something you, in it you agree or disagree with, I'm happy to sort of have that conversation with you in the comments below. Hey, if you like this video, please feel encouraged to hit that subscribe button because there's going to be so many more of these classics of science fiction, horror, and fantasy to come. Uh, particularly ones that are ones that we may have lost or never heard about like this one. <laughs> I had to add this one to the Wikipedia page. Uh, so there's going to be a whole lot more of these to follow. Anyway, uh, if you read this... Uh, also, finally, if you watch this video all the way to the end, hey, I just want to thank you for taking some time out of your day. We all have busy days, busy lives. So the fact that you spent this time with me, that's very humbling, and I appreciate that. So thanks again.